Good afternoon, ladies and menfolk. Welcome to Word Ninjas Live, episode 54. You are joining us today for an author interview. We finally got another one queued up. Well, author interview and cover artist. <laughs> yeah, right. I forgot about that part. <laughs> <laughs> As always, I'm your instigator of literary productivity, Charles. And joining me today is our special guest, Lisa Emowitz. Yeah, who really didn't know she was going to be seen, but fortunately was bathed, so that was good. <laughs> I too just took a shower. I was clean. That helps. <laughs> Had to throw on some makeup, but, you know, whatever. And our other co-host, Justin. I was a person speaking earlier. And Calvin. Oh, hi. <laughs> and Will. Hello. Hi. We have a pretty full group this time around. And I'm looking at the title for this video, and I already see that I need to change that, because for some reason it claims that it's episode 50. Oh. It is episode 54. How did that happen? Hmm. The four and the zero aren't even close to each other on the Can I ask you guys a favor? <laughs> since no I excuse. told everybody that they could just... I mean, if they click on the link that I put on Twitter and Facebook, will they find this? Oh, yeah, it'll go directly to oh, right. the video. It's okay. just the title Fine. for it went to bits. Surprise, surprise, everybody. I lied. I told you you were just going to hear me. But I get to see me, too. <laughs> I'm sure you're all so thrilled. Surprises for everyone. <laughs> 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 Let's see here. Interview section. Uh, if you go to our website, it has links to her website, the two books, Breaking Glass and Vision, and also her Twitter handle. Backwards? Does it show up backwards? Um, nope, yes. it's shown correctly. It shows. Okay, good. It looks that backwards. is one of them. And it also has all the questions that we shall be asking. But for all the answers, you have to finish. You have to continue watching Good, the video. because I might lie and say things differently. Yes. <laughs> That's half the fun to be live. <laughs> yep. All my students won't find this too shocking or interesting because they're used to this. <laughs> <laughs> well, if anyone's watched any of our earlier episodes with interviews, this is par for the course. Good. Well, yeah. Shy, I am not. All right. Diving into the questions. What are your books, Breaking Glass and Vision, about, and just how did the ideas for them come about? <laughs> okay. We're going to have to take this in steps because there's no easy answer to that. First, let's start with what they're about. How about we start with Vision first, since that is the one that is coming out in less than a month. Okie dokie. I'll try to be brief, um, even though I was not brief in my written um, you know, explanation. Vision is about a boy named Bobby Pendel who lives in a, a, a fictitious town in upstate New York in the Catskills. Um, I will interject that most of my stories come from real places in my head, but I just kind of screw around with them and make them what I want them to be. So we actually have a house in the Catskills, and in my mind, it's kind of our old house and this house that was on the hill. Well, anyway, Bobby is this hard scrabble kind of kid. He um, is um, responsible for his younger brother and his um, kind of screwed up dad, and he... Um, He's fishing on a lake because he's, he goes fishing to kind of add to the meal plan. And he has this vision of something dead at the bottom of the lake. He sees bones. And um, that's accompanied by this really weird, blinding uh, migraine headache. So what happens is he starts having these headaches where he starts to like lose his sight. And he doesn't know what the hell's going on with him. And, and these visions are getting stronger and stronger. And he doesn't know if he's going nuts, if he's dying, or if maybe there's a real killer out there. And um, I'm not going to say anything else. 
<laughs> it's scary. Oh, breaking glass, right? Mm -hmm. Am I supposed to answer that? Yes, right? please. Breaking glass came out in July um, 2013. And it's also from a boy's point of view. Now, don't ask me how or why I do this. I guess maybe it has something to do with that I'm the mother of a guy. You know, I raised one of them, so I kind of... I don't really understand the way they think, but I kind of came up with a formula for the way they communicate, and it kind of worked. <laughs> one of my students actually was telling me, how do you do that? I go, uh, well, I'll get to that. Anyway, Breaking Glass is um, about Jeremy Glass. He is very different from Bobby. In fact, they may meet each other in a book of the future, and they will not get along <laughs> because they're very different. Jeremy is a history nerd, track star, obnoxious pain in the butt, who also has a drinking problem. And he also has an obsession with a girl, Susanna, for reasons really unknown only to Jeremy. Um, Susanna doesn't want him. She wants his best friend. And then one night, his best friend who he has seen cheating on Susanna, has a big fight with her, and he chases after them in his car after a little... <laughs> which wasn't really smart. And um, he has an accident, which turns out to be not so good for him, and Susanna has turned up missing. So he thinks she's dead, and he thinks his friend killed her, and he somehow manages to summon her from beyond the grave. And that's breaking glass. Now you want to know how I, how I came up with this stuff? Are you serious? Now I want to read both of them. Oh, God. How do I come up with these things? I don't know. Well, here I am in a summer thing. I'm a, I'm a professor. I don't know if I mentioned that. Yeah, I know. It's hard to believe that somebody would actually pay me to teach someone, but it's true. I see this. <laughs> and I'm really not that much different when I teach because I teach design. So I get to be crazy, and my students are a little not less crazy. And um, we have a lot of fun. Don't laugh too hard. I know I'm pretty laughable. And um, so I get the good fortune of having summers off, sort of. I do a lot during the summer with my job, too. But um, we have gone to many different locations through the summers, through the Hudson Valley of New York State, I'm located in New York City. So a lot of my stories have um, taken root from the various places I've stayed. I have yet to write a story set where I live, for real. I guess because when I'm a fish out of water, I tend to get really curious about what's around me. And breaking glass, um, I don't even know where the first idea came from. Maybe just thinking of Hitchcock's rear window. You know, like a guy that was convalescing and see something really weird. I really couldn't even tell you. But the idea kind of came into my head in 2009. And it just sat there and went no place. Until I went to this horse farm um, in upstate New York. And the landlady was a little strange. Really strange. And I did not like her. And she had this daughter. And they were fighting all the time. And I was like, God, this is like such a good story. <laughs> what do I do with this? And then somehow, I don't know, it just became breaking glass. Like the whole thing came together and the house was the house and it just happened. So I don't think, you know, vision, I have no clue. All I can tell you is that if you go on my where do I have this? Probably on Facebook. I, I'll get to post it on my blog, but somewhere in some of my social media lives, I have a picture of a lake that's also in upstate New York. And I did not remember that this was the lake in Vision. I, I had no clue. We went there this summer for the first time in about 10 years. Hmm. I walked out to this lake where our friend was still sitting there. Hi, Marion, if you're watching. And I'm like, oh, my God. This is the lake. This is Scratch Lake. This is the lake. And I, I just couldn't believe it. So I don't know if that answers the question, where these things come from. I'm obviously not entirely sane, so that's probably where most of it comes from. Oh, you're in perfect company for that. I know. That's yes. Like and and, and you, you say that you're insane, but you seem to have a very bubbly uh, personality. Yeah. Um, based based yeah. on the two... Yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah. Well, based on the two book descriptions, it seems like you have the ability to go to a dark place, at yeah, least for your that's writing. Yeah, I mean about being insane. It's like how I project. I'm going to just quote a former student of mine, Paul. Hi, Paul, if you're listening. Probably isn't. Paul was a student and a tutor who I became, you know, we were very, we had a very good relationship, working relationship, and I was telling Paul, God, I have to do a website, you know, and my writing is so dark, but I'm not. And I did all this stuff, and he looks at me and he goes, you can't have a website that looks really dark. He says, because you are truly a ridiculous person. <laughs> I said, you are absolutely right. So what does one do? And actually, if you go on my website, you will see there's a logo there that I designed myself, and it's of a girl with a skirt, and her, her skirt is made of words. And um, I actually got that in a logo uh, annual thing this year. And I, I feel that kind of does it all. It's sort of light. It doesn't really, you know, I don't know. I'm sure you know people who are watching this will be able to tell you just about how ridiculous I am because I'm really consistent. My whole family, my students, my friends, <laughs> even the people who work with me in public, they all know. <laughs> do, you, do you find it uh, a challenge to show off your work to close family and friends with some of the dark material that you uh, write about? No. You, no actually, they, they understand me. Yeah, they, they're used to me. They know. <laughs> In fact, they've been very supportive, my family. They've read it. My mother, who hates dark things, actually got through Breaking Glass, which was really, I was really impressed with that. Hi, Aunt. Aunt Darlene. Hi, Aunt Darlene. Uncle Roy. They all read it. They, you know, they were fine. They already know I'm crazy, so they were like, yeah, you know, it's Lisa. <laughs> Nothing surprises us. Yeah, that sounds pretty much like the rest of us. I mean, We're you know, I don't odd. have airs, you know. I just try to be who I am, and it's like I can't, you can't, like we're all very complicated, aren't we? We all have many sides to us, and, um, you know, it's the way it goes. Mm. And uh, sorry for keep bringing up the darkness, but I am a, a, a horror writer as well, uh, so I have some experience with that. Um, and I always find that talk. I rarely get a chance to talk to other horror writers, uh, mm -hmm. so this is an exciting chance. Yeah. Um, what what level of, of darkness do your do your stories get? I'm not that like, dark. I mean, I'm really much more psychological. You know? Behind the scenes versus like the shock I'm, type stuff. I'm really interested in people, characters. Every all my stories are about characters, and it's kind of like, you know. I'll bring up my mother again and things she probably will remember about me as a kid. Um, I used to like to play with my Barbies. And I know this sounds like I'm not answering your question, but I am. And I would play with my Barbies. And I remember the way my daughter would play with her Barbies was like, oh, let's go to the fair. You know, it was very light and cute. My Barbies were getting amputations. <laughs> they were getting in car accidents. I mean, <laughs> that's how I've always been. I used to stare up at the sky as a little kid and go, I wonder if I've lived before. And I, I distinctly remember thinking this when I was four years old. So I'm bubbly, I'm smiley, because that's just how I am. That's just, I guess, it, it wouldn't really work with how I look to be any other way, because I just happen to be made this tiny little perky looking person. It's just me, you know? But it's just a veneer. <laughs> um, so the dark, I don't know. I don't enjoy just doing dark, gross things for the sake of doing them. I like, I guess, honestly, my real drive to do this kind of things came after 9-11. So I'm not going to get a little serious, okay? You know, I'm not that young, you can maybe tell, and I've got grown kids, and I was one of these people who lived in New York City and had small children at the time of 9-11. And, you know, I was raised to think that you had to shield children and not tell them how rotten and crappy the world was until 9-11 and Harry Potter and I was reading Harry Potter and I'm like wow you know Harry Potter has figured you know JK Rowling has figured out a way to show children that there is darkness out there but it's possible it's possible to still um, be positive and you know 
take control of it. So for me, I think a lot of it's about dealing with things that are really crappy and just dealing with them head on. And I guess that's really where it stems from for me. But I didn't really think about that before. I mean, I didn't think about it when you asked me these questions, but I think that's why I like dark, because you can't have light if you don't have dark. I find writing an excellent coping mechanism. Oh, that too. I think for me that's what really started me with it. I mean, I was freaked. So I needed to just kind of, it was therapy. Yeah, really. the, uh, the, the book that I'm writing now is, uh, it, it, it gets extremely dark. And a, a lot of it is from a, a recent school shooting that we had here in Connecticut at Sandy Hook. Oh, yeah, I remember mm. that one. And uh, my my you wife. Live right there? Uh, Do you live right near there, Newtown? Yeah, we live right near there, and my wife worked there the year before, and she knew I all those kids. I just drove past there like a few months ago, and I was like, oh. Yeah. And I had a lot of trouble coping with this situation, even though it was weird because I had nothing to do with it on victim or perpetrator side. So I had no I, – I'm really empathetic, even when I shouldn't be, probably. Yeah. So it, it really – you know, it was really hard on me, mm -hmm. the, the shooting. Um, even though I wasn't a parent of any of the kids, but just psychologically uh, took me to a we really weird place. And I found that uh, writing about it and, you know, mm -hmm. this guy, he goes through uh, a school shooting where he loses his daughter and he goes through a very uh, awful psychological breakdown. Wow. And then uh, lots of things happen along the way. That's your book. Sure. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> uh, not done yet. Still working oh, on it. cool. What, but, um, uh, are you a parent? No, I'm not a parent. Uh, but I grew up uh, in a very loving household and had uh, two little brothers that I uh, took care of at various times in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was the oldest child. Mm -hmm. So all my cousins were younger than me. Yeah. Uh, I always sat at the kids' table and babysat. Yeah. Um, so you, and, you were, you're kind of a protective type. Right, yeah. And... and like I said, I, I've always been very empathetic. Yeah. Well, I do think that writing is a very good um, way of um, dealing with stuff. I mean, I've always been an artist. You know, that that's really, like, who I am, who I was born as, you know, a visual person. And that's where I always used to turn when I needed – I mean, I was actually a very moody, depressed uh, kid as a teenager. And a lot of people will deny this. I guess I put on a good front. I mean, now I'm not. I'm like, this is ridiculously happy. I don't know why. But as a kid, I was just moody and dark and whatever. And I always turned to art because art was the place where I felt I had control. But, you know, it wasn't really, um, it just missed short of the mark. And when I started writing at a very late age in life, I found it satisfied something for me that I'd never uh, um, had before. It's just really cathartic, I guess. I don't know what I was I was going to use that word as well. Yeah. So I, I, I think it's also a really nice balance of using your left and right brain. Because with art, for me, it's always the right brain, the right brain. And my left brain would just kind of shrivel there like a dried up husk. And with writing, it's like you're really using your whole mind, you know? It's really like your whole mind is alive and engaged. And you're just problem solving, but you're creating. And it's... It's really, yeah, it could drive you nuts, too. I mean, mm -hmm. I will tell you a story. My really close friend, I wasn't, like, admitting I was writing. I was like I was an addict. I was like a drinker or something. I was like Jeremy Glass. I wouldn't tell anybody that I was writing. And she's like, God, you've been so weird lately. What's the matter with you? You never want to talk to me. And I'm like, it's not you. I've been writing. <laughs> and then I told her about what I was writing. And she looked at me right in the eye, and she said, you know, I know you a really long time, and I always knew you were a little odd, but I never realized you were this odd. So it was Being like a writer. Yeah. I went down to even deeper levels of odd, you know. It does that. You don't even know they're there, right? You just yeah. like, oh, my, how did I get here? I didn't know there was that sub-basement down there. Cool. And it's safe. It's safer than doing really horrible things in real life, right? That, that's also true. Legal. Mm-hmm.
I've always, uh, you know, I, I grew up wanting to be, you know, some sort of cinematographer or graphic artist. You know, I really know how to paint a scene in my brain. Uh -huh. But getting it onto, you know, an artistic medium was always very difficult for me. I was never a very good drawer. I was never a very good painter. Mm -hmm. And all, you know, and I, I and I didn't have the. I lived in. I grew up in a small town in New Hampshire, so the opportunities for me to, you know, run over to, you know, DreamWorks or something. Or industrial light and magic was a was a pipe dream that was never going to happen. Uh, oh, but then I just really wanted it, but but then I I discovered writing really helps facilitate a lot of that, and it and it allowed me to break through barriers that I wasn't able to break through before, yeah. and get my ideas out there um, in a more efficient way and a more. Uh, while while I would still probably like to do play around some cinematography, I think writing is a very good uh, happy medium for where I am right now. Yeah, you don't need a team. You don't need, you know, you don't need really anything. You don't need any right. equipment. You just I don't need to wait. wait for it to rain by the ocean right. during the sunset. I can just write about it right away. You know, the thing is, with art that always drove me crazy was I would have something in my head, and I was never happy. It never really turned out the way I saw it. And with writing, it's, like, so cool to think that it's in your head, and... It doesn't have to be fully formed, and it's just like you have to get it in someone else's head and let them kind of take it over, and I love that. I love that you could suggest something, and, and when people kind of get it, they get that vibe, they share it with you. I think that, to me, I love that. You know, I think that's the thing about myself that art did not really um, uh, satisfy, because I do think that somewhere inside of me is a frustrated but extremely untalented actress, which is probably why I teach, because I am very, I'm, I guess I'm kind of a ham, but I was not blessed with any kind of talent to do with anything theatrical. No singing, no dancing, no acting, no nothing, just talking. <laughs> and for me, you know, writing is kind of almost theatrical. You're like staging a whole, you know, right? It's like you're making a movie, kind of, and it's happening in time, and other people could kind of experience it. So I think, you know, I guess that was the attraction. I mean, I did want to study illustration, so that does tell you that I was thinking about something to do with storytelling and narrative. And I actually found out that I don't like illustration at all. I like design because it involves words and type, which I love. So. Hopefully this is not going to be an awkward question, but what is the difference between illustration and design? Because oh, okay. I, I am not artistic in the least. Okay, well I'll do my best to explain. Well you know the difference between photography and design, right? Yes. Correct? Yeah. Photography is an image of uh, something that's actually there, right? Yes. So. Illustration is a visual representation, pictorial, you know, of, of images. It doesn't have words. It doesn't, doesn't, um, it doesn't involve type, usually, although there could be some illustrations that are typography. Um, but illustration has become, um, I think, less prevalent, less of a, distinctive kind of area anymore because everybody has their hands on so much technology. You could you could take a photo, you could stick it in something. So design is a book cover. A book a design is a combination of word and image to create um, a visual uh, piece of communication that that says something to you. When you look at a book, here's my book cover, right? Mm -hmm. I mean it's got words on it, right? But are the words just words? Are they typed? Like like a typewriter, are they? Nope. No. So the type that you choose with the colors and the words, that's design. Hmm. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of design. There's furniture design, clothing design, but graphic design is using images and typography to get a message across. That's not just the actual content message, but that is the underlying. Um, uh, 
the underlying visceral message you're trying to get across. You're trying to communicate something emotional to 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 your audience. You're mm -hmm. trying to reach them in a way that's not just uh, the language that you're using. So, does that answer your question? Yes. This has been your educational moment for the episode. I mean, how about this? Do you let's see what what do um, you like video games, right? Uh, more than I should. Okay. Does the video game come in a box? Not as often as it used to, but uh, when so I can get it in a box. Does yes. the company that makes the video game have a logo? Yes. Okay. Somebody had to design that logo. That's graphic design. <laughs> Somebody and had to design the website. Some are better than others. What? Some are better designed well, than others. Well, that's the whole point. A lot of people think just because they have Sia, you know, Creative Suite 7 that they're designers, but hello. Nope. There's, you know, there's art behind. Just like somebody who thinks they have Microsoft Word as a writer. As we all know, there's a lot of craft involved. So, you know, like with anything, there's craft. Mm. And design has its own set of crafts that you, you know, eventually learn. Hope I didn't get too preachy with my design. Not at all. <laughs> I get a little uppity with design. <laughs> Hi, students. <laughs> they know that. I'm a little less uppity about writing because I feel like I'm much more of a novice as a writer. Like, I'm not as confident as a writer. I guess I'm a little bit snottier about this. <laughs> Although, you know, I could probably learn a few things about that, too. I've just been doing it a lot longer. Ah. Uh, God, does that sound obnoxious? I'm sorry. No, not at all. Apologies, everybody. Because I'm sitting here alone on a porch. I'm just wander meandering and <laughs> blabbing and losing myself. So stop me if I sound like kind of a jerk. That sounds like every other episode we've done so far. Mm. Good. That's, I guess it's good, right? If I just time. sat here and went, hello, and not spoke, <laughs> you wouldn't like that. Not particularly. <laughs> uh, actually, CJ sort of half brought this up already, but... Something that I just thought of is that when you're dealing with design and, and, and illustration, the the thing that you produce can be easily digested uh, very quickly, right. uh, getting your point across, where writing requires, and reading, I should say, requires a, a large investment yeah. to, to get the art across. Uh, do you feel like you can expose a lot more ideas through writing for that? Uh, mm -hmm. in, that, in that sense, and do you think yeah. that um, doing the design and, and, and illustration, does it now leave you a little bit more empty, like you wish you could do more, like you were doing with writing, or do you keep those two things very separate? I think they're kind of separate for me, um, but I mean, not to diss design, you know, design's a wonderful thing, it's really necessary, I think, to make our lives better. Um, but design to me is, um, you know, it's a tool. It's, it's, it's done for a purpose. It's not, I know there are people who do design as a creative expression. I have a former student who's been exploring that kind of thing, and I think that's really cool. But for me, design is not about personal self-expression. It's about problem solving. So it's very satisfying when you solve the problem. I particularly... I think the reason I love doing cover design so much is because I am I'm doing something that's so important for the other writer. It's like I feel like a midwife. Like I'm to me, cover design is the most meaningful kind of design that I I do because I am facilitating the birth of their book, their baby. It's the thing they worked really hard on, and I'm trying to help them give it a face. And I've gotten to be pretty friendly with a couple of my, you know, Spencer Hill Press co-authors because particularly the ones that are really good at visualizing their shout out, Jennifer, <laughs> Elizabeth, they're my, they're my buds. And we got really friendly from this, it's kind of intimate, you know, like designing their cover. So 
that form of design I take really seriously and I love it. I love it. I and I do I do enjoy it in a way almost as much as writing my own books. <laughs> Um, it's a different part of my brain, but I really love it a lot. It's frustrating when it's not going well, but when it comes together and they're happy, and the absolute worst thing, the hardest thing, is doing my own cover. Because I'm telling you, what a bitch for a client. Oh, God. <laughs> the worst client ever. Um, but that's hard. Really hard, but I fortunately mm -hmm. have uh, Kate Kynak from Spencer Hill Press, who's the editor in chief, um, my other, my fellow squirrel on crack, as we call ourselves, and uh, we, you know, work back and forth. She kind of stops me when I'm out of control, which is not that easy to do, and she's not always that successful because she's a little out of control herself. <laughs> but um, yeah, you can want to see it when we all get together. Um, come to BEA. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's the form of design that. Fun, uh, more fun. Uh, convenient tie-in to one of the questions we had. What process do you use to figure out your cover art from, like, here's the idea that wants to be conveyed to here's the finished product? Well, it's obviously pretty different when I do my own cover, because then I'm just kind of like, ooh. <laughs> 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 but, okay, I have an author questionnaire. That um, you know, it really depends on um, the the um, when I work directly with a with a client that comes to me outside of Spencer Hill Press, I give them the, I have to work directly with them, and I have a form. It's pretty short that I have them fill out, and Spencer Hill Press also gives out this form. And sometimes I will work with the author, depending on the author, and sometimes I will work with the editor. Um, it really also depends on the individuals involved because some authors are really good. Hi, Elizabeth <laughs> and Jennifer. Those are Jennifer. I'm just going to give a shout out for them. Jennifer Mergia has got her Forest of Whispers coming out. I did the cover. Elizabeth Langston has her book. Um, what is coming out next? The third book um, in the Whisper Fall series. That's in October. These two ladies I had a great time working with because they have really sharp images in their mind. So other authors are very light. They have too much in their heads. <laughs> Not like Nobody never has enough. They always have either too much or just the right amount. So what I do is I give them a questionnaire. I ask for a synopsis, you know, like about 150 words. What, what is this book about? I ask for some description of some of the characters main characters. I ask for either locations or objects or things that are really significant in the book. Of course I need to know the genre. It's mm -hmm. basically me like a doctor. I feel like I'm got the doc I'm like the doctor and the book is a patient. I have it on the examining table and I'm looking at it with a stethoscope and I'm taking its pulse and I'm trying to figure out what makes this thing tick. You know, that's my that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to like figure it out. Who is it? Who are you? And um, and then my job is to take all of that and make it into a book cover that's actually marketable. And this is what's that? Uh, Justin wandered off. Okay, <laughs> just suddenly this like hex, <laughs> this decahedron, whatever that thing is, showed up. like mineral object. Anyway, so um, yeah, I, I just try to. Wandered off. Hello. Anyway, I, 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 I try to figure out uh, what the book's about, and then I, I really, it's my job to make it work as a cover so that it, it appeals, you know? And mm -hmm. this is something that, um, you know, my, my colleague and owner, Spencer Hill Preston, and I, we did, uh, Kate, we did a panel at PyCon. I was at PyCon. I was dressed up as um, Irene Adler from Sherlock Holmes. Okay, I promised my friends I wasn't going to say anything about that, and I'm not. <laughs> but um, and um, and uh, we did a panel on what makes a good book cover and what makes a crappy book cover. And you know, after you take all this information, you have to you have to you have to um, condense it into something that's quick. You know, like you said, quick, instantaneous. Mm -hmm. Like a book, you take your time. But again, a book has to grab you on the first page, right? If it's not interesting in the first page, first chapter, you're not going to read it. So a cover has to be like, bam, 
and it has to go directly to its particular audience. If you're doing a young adult novel, a young adult horror novel, you're not going to make it look like Fifty Shades of Grey or something. Well, I would hope or, not. You know what? I would hope not. No, but I'm just saying you have to know who it's going to, and then it's like you're looking inward to figure out what is this book about, and then you're looking outward, like whose eyes. You know, I had a whole big argument with my daughter. Well, I don't know if she's watching. She's a design student um, in first year. She just finished first year, and God help me. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, a lot of arguments go on, and she hated the cover I just did for my book that nobody's going to see yet because it's, like, in 2015. She's okay. like, oh, God, it's really so, oh. And I'm like, you know, honey, you may not like it with your, like, really cool hipster design student sensibilities, I said, but this book has to sell to the people who are going to read it. And those people are not you. You are a almost 19-year-old, you know, design student, college student, and this has to appeal to, like, 15-year-olds, of which you are not one. Do you understand that? And I said, you need to try to understand that as a designer yourself. So, you know, I mean, it could be horrible. We could be completely wrong about the cover, and who even knows, you know? Who really knows? There's no real easy answer to what will appeal to whom. It's a lot of it's just guesswork and gut work. Mm. So there's no formula. Did I answer that okay? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. What other questions did we have in the queue? Uh, what's one of your favorite covers or one that you had a lot of fun creating? Hmm. Should I find it for you? I'll, I'll get it. I'll, I'll, or can you find it? I don't know which one it is offhand. All right, hold on. I'm going to just go to my website, my iPad here. Um, okay, well, one of the ones I really liked that I did was for this series called um, The uh, Obsidian Pebble. I did that for um, Spencer Hill Press, and there's two, The Obsidian Pebble and uh, Beast of Seaborn. Um, hold on. You know, I just get kind of suddenly terrible with uh, with technology when I'm under pressure. <laughs> Figure out what I'm doing. Um, I'm gonna just try to go to my website and uh, find some stuff for you. Um, I don't know. You know, I'm I'm really funny about my covers. It's like they're really fun to do, but kind of like when they're done, they're done for me. Mm. I guess. The ones that are the most special for me are when people really like them so much themselves, you know, when the author's really happy. So, wait, that's not good. Um, give me a sec. I'm sorry. I'm kind of uh, screwed here. I'm just trying to find my own actually website. Have the web actually, they have the website up. So oh, you do? Okay. You can tell me which one uh, oh, you know, I can bring it up. Can you go to the Cover Design Gallery? Yes. Already there. Okay. I'm seeing blank, black, nothing. Didn't see anything. Oh. Uh, I'll try it myself. That hold on a second. Let me screen share. Oh, you did the cover for uh, Copper Girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like those. That's another really good friend, Jennifer. She's another person. I mean, we just like, I don't know how, we did those so quickly. Oh, actually... Copper Ravens. That's one of the ones I really like. That and was a nice you, uh, you see it? Yes. See Copper Ravens? Bring up Copper Ravens. I really, really mm. like that one, and I'll tell you why. That, and the way that happened is a pretty good example of when an author and a writer are, like, somehow mind-melding. Jennifer is another person that who, that I know from Spencer Hill Press. She's a different Jennifer. This is Jennifer Alice Povos, and we just, we have nicknames for each other. We're really strange. <laughs> Should I talk and say what they are? But um, we, uh, Copper Girls is one of the earlier covers that I did, and it just came together really quickly because I, I really loved her. You know what? Her books were one of the few that I actually read the whole book, and I didn't have to. I just loved them so much. So I, like, really love her books. Um, I usually don't read the whole book, but in Jennifer's case, I did read the whole books, and 
I did not read all of Copper Ravens, but I loved Copper Girl so much that when it was time to do the second one, Jennifer said to me, I have an idea. I want to have um, a girl that looks like this. <laughs> so she <laughs> sends me this picture of a girl that looks like this. I go, okay. And we look all over Shutterstock, and we mm -hmm. just can't find anything. And I said, you know, um, I think we're going to have to do an original photograph, which is something we don't generally do because we don't really have that kind of budget. But mm -hmm. I did get permission. It just so happened that my son, who's a photographer, you could I'll do a shout out for him. He doesn't talk to me much, but he's a really amazing photographer. Ben Zang Photography. You could show his stuff, whatever. Anyway, Ben has a friend who was visiting who was a very good, more commercial kind of photographer, this lovely young lady, Carol. And I said, Carol, if I were to give you an idea, could you just shoot it like off in Virginia where you live and blah, blah, blah? She goes, sure. So Jennifer sends me this um, image. I did a sketch of what I thought the cover should look like. I sent it to Jennifer. She's like, perfect. I'm like, okay, that was easy. I sent it to Carol in Virginia. Jennifer's, mind you, in Massachusetts. I'm in New York. Carol's in Virginia. Carol sees the sketch. She goes, I'll show you some, some models. She sends us pictures of these different girls who are like, her, she's the one. She goes, okay. I'll shoot it. She sends me this beautiful picture of this girl with hair flying, hands over her face. And I took that, and it became the cover. And it was just, like, ridiculously easy. I mean, I've had things that are a lot less complicated that a lot of people do. So that one was really easy and fun. I don't know why. It's probably just because I was dealing with geniuses. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> A random question. Um, when it comes to typography, like, what is your uh, what is your your process of going through uh, fonts to use for your covers? Well, um, I since we're on a tight budget, I will often use free online fonts. I mean, I, I kind of you know my students will know that I'm like the t I'm like the font whisperer. I just have to find the font that feels right. And I will go through, I will, I will go through, in this case, for some reason, I just knew I wanted to use, I think that's Penumbra Flair. I just had that, I just knew I needed that font. I don't know. But I'll just test drive them. I'll write the word out over and over and over until it looks right. You know, it's just trial and error, really. It's like I'm looking for something that's readable. I'm looking for type that reflects the feeling I'm looking for. Again, there's no formula here. It's really, you know... Just coming across the right one. It's just gut. <laughs> it's a gut level thing with me, you know? And I think with design, it's... um. I think with design, it's, 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 it's fun because it's digital, so you could just go through so many iterations so quickly. You know, it's like, it's mm. like this... Ha you know, design for me, designing covers, I almost sometimes feel like I'm like Gandalf. <laughs> like, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, let it be so. You know, it's like, no, change the font. Oh, change the color. Oh, change the whole you. And it's like magical things happen. It's really fun. You know, drawing by hand, writing is arduous and it's lengthy and it's not so quick. But with design, it's like one little adjustment layer and boom. You've changed everything. So, trial and error. Yeah, I know that one all too well. Uh, you like to do design a, too? I'm a web designer. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay. Well, you know, the main really nuts and bolts thing about design for me is visibility. And, you know, this is like what I teach like on the first day of my typography class. I get if you can't see the type, it sucks. I don't care how pretty the font is. It has to pop. The title has to be seen. You have to be able to reduce the title down to like this size, and you still have to see the title. It has to pop out at you. If it doesn't work like that, if you have to look more than two seconds and to see the type, to see what it says, if it's not visible, it's a fail. It's no good. So, 
you know, it's really like a dance between the visual and the and the, the type. It's it's all of a piece. It's key. Yep, I understand that when um, all too well, especially trying to find fonts. Not uh, not just for <clears throat> not just for headers and menus and everything. Just for just trying to find a a readable font that will pop just for regular text. Oh well, you know, with I would stick with the basics with that. Like for for I'm very conservative when I'm doing like page layout, or um, I'm like so boring and conservative. Like I just basically use Caslon, Avenir, and Helvetica. <laughs> <laughs> like so boring because I just think that readability comes first when you're dealing with text. Fancy crap doesn't work with text. It's like a chair. You know how they tried to make really crazy chairs once? Remember? Right. I mean, you're probably too young, but probably in the 70s they were always trying to like make unusual different chairs. And you know, we're made a certain way. So we like to sit on chairs that, you know, work with gravity well. I think type is the same thing. We're just programmed to read a certain way, and that's not going to change anytime soon. So, you know, design is one thing. Covers something vis that's like a, a like more of a aesthetic kind of thing. But when you're dealing with legibility and reading text, um, right. I think it has to be you know readability is first. So don't get too creative with that. <laughs> yeah, that's something I've learned early on. No, no script, no italics, no. no uh, yeah. no, 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 no. Uh, 12 point, 10 to 12 point. Hi, class. <laughs> August 27. Syrups everywhere. <laughs> oh, yeah. If my students are watching, they're probably going, oh, God, there she goes. Damn it. <laughs> I thought we had the summer off. <laughs> yeah, I'll, anyway. st I'll stick with Phil. Helvetica hmm? slash. <clears throat> I'll usually stick with Helvetica slash Ariel or. Um, do, 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 do. Ariel's like the poor step cousin of Helvetica. I know, but Helvetica new. Helvetica new. That's a good one. Try that. I I know that, but unfortunately, most people run Windows computers, and yeah. Windows does not come with Helvetica. Oh yeah. That's. Um, don't even I'm not gonna start me on that. I'm not going to go into that. Don't I'm glad we're on the same page start about that. Me on my Mac. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the reasons I switched to Mac. Oh, good Just for so you. So I can get I a little more like... Helvetica in my life. <laughs> you, could, you know, you could, if you got Adobe Creative Suite, it runs on PC and it comes with all the fonts and everything. I mean, you could get good fonts on a PC. It's not like, hmm. it's not like they don't work. You know. Well, I... I know. I only got I only got this Mac what three weeks ago. So good for you. Good smart move. <laughs> yes, I am very pleased with it. Yep. But, if you don't like viruses, you will like Macs because I'm not gonna jinx this, these suckers. But I didn't even tell you how long I've been on a Mac, but I don't think I had a virus ever in all those years. <laughs> Probably as long as you've been alive. <laughs> or longer. Oh. <laughs> uh, Lucky you! I'm actually uh, I'm actually on my desktop now, and uh, it's a uh, it's a custom built Windows PC. Um, on top of being a web designer, I'm also I also uh, uh, run the IT department at my job. So wait, who's talking here? Oh, Calvin here. Uh, uh let me take off screen share. Oh, hello. There you are. You were just like a <laughs> you weren't even there. I just heard this like disembodied voice. <laughs> Well, I know in certain areas you've got to go PC. It's just essential, right? Yeah, but um, it's only been three. Uh, well, I've actually had a hand-me-down MacBook Pro for uh, about nine months before I got uh, got my new baby. But just just in that short time, I've been able to see all the advantages of having a Mac. Huh? Just. Just from, uh, just from, just from coding, <laughs> designing, and just the fact that I have not had to like worry about viruses. Yeah, and that's pretty liberating. Not having to worry about viruses, it's very liberating. My, my, um, the, the CLT in the lab where I teach, when I yeah. we've been teaching, we've been working together since 1998. And um, when he first came in there, he was like Mr. PC. He's like, oh, you're on your Macs. You know, now he's like. 
sees her evil. And he, and he comes into me goes, <laughs> one day. He goes, you know, he goes, uh, do you know how many PC, it's an adjoining lab, one, one side's PC, the other is all Mac, where I teach is all Mac. So he comes in and he goes, do you know how many of my computers on the PC side are disabled right now? I said, how many, Ralph? He goes, seven. That's just the new ones. He goes, seven, huh? I go, in all the years we've been working together, how many viruses have we had in this Mac lab? And Ralph looks at me and he goes, you want to know? You want to know? Zero! <laughs> I said, that's right. Zero. Hey, I've I've stuck to with Windows. A lot of years, <clears throat> no viruses. <laughs> I've stuck with Windows this whole time because that's what I grew up on. Though, yeah, well, though to, you know. Though to be fair, I've we're been supposed to be talking about writing. Let's not go geeking out here. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll we'll save we'll save that for after the show. <laughs> this episode has been brought to you by Apple computers. I know it's, it's ridiculous. It's like, oh uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't feel too bad sticking up for Apple. It's better, you know, there's worse things to stick up for, like Amazon or something. <laughs> 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 oh, I just go blank now. They're going to come in here and tell us down. <laughs> <laughs> I love Apple. Um, I'm beginning to understand why now. Well, you know what? I think the thing that made it really clear to me was a long time ago I was shopping for a monitor. This is way back when I only use laptops now, but I had a monitor and a de and a desktop, and I was looking for a monitor. I go, well, which is the best monitor here? Why does that one look so blurry? I can't get that. And the guy goes, well, that's because it's hooked up to a PC. He goes, I'll show it to you the same thing on a Mac. And it was like, oh, it's like the interface. It's just, you know, Macs have been crystal clear sharp since 1986. You know. And I mean, I don't even have a Retina display. I think I don't even know how good that is. Probably even better it's than that. It's amazing. I, I will tell you right now. It's, just it's like amazing. almost like okay, you know, 2020 vision is good. What do I need 2010 for? You know, it's <laughs> like I'm happy with what I have. It's clear enough for me. Probably I couldn't even see it anywhere with my eyesight. You know, so. Well, <clears throat> you'll be able to tell the difference. It it's the difference is tremendous. Wow. Like come <clears throat> coming from. Coming from the uh, hand-me-down 13-inch uh, MacBook uh, MacBook Pro that I had to my 15-inch uh, yeah. Retina display now, wow! Wow! <laughs> yeah. Well, I bought the iPad. I bought the cheap old iPad. I was just was too cheap to get the Retina. <laughs> but you know, I I don't I don't really even work on PCs. I don't know if they've improved their resolution at all. I would imagine by now maybe they figured it out. No. Because um, it after, used to be just like horrified me. Yeah, it's gotten be <clears throat> better, it's gotten right? significantly better. Not time. It's, got a, it's a bit of a bit of a ways to go, but it's better. It's yeah. Better. Well, that's good. Because <laughs> I mean, I work on 27-inch IMAX at work, and it's like, man, you know, it's sharp, really sharp. I am jealous. <laughs> They're not mine. They belong to the college. I just have my little, thir my little 13-inch iMac here. I mean, uh, iBook, whatever it is, Mac Pro, MacBook Pro, <laughs> and my other toy. Still, je still jealous. Be jealous. <laughs> Be very jealous. <laughs> come and come to my school. I'll, I'll teach you design. I suck at web design though, so you're not gonna learn anything about that from me. How many different classes do you teach? I tend to be on the, right now I, I just teach three because I'm the deputy chairperson, chief cook and bottle washer and head cheerleader of the department. So uh, I end up having to get involved with a lot of administrative stuff like advising students and uh, August is so nice because my Facebook isn't going like, bloop, 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 help, help, help. <laughs> I, you know, three classes. They're at upper level. I teach a portfolio class where I, I, I teach an intermediate level design uh, layout uh, design class, which um, um, I'm a little nice in. You know, I kind of start off. We do we do book covers, we do magazines, we do 
you know, we tend to do print things because that's just my background, but I still feel like the basics of design have not really changed. So, you know, the technology is all great, but you still need to learn the aesthetics, you know, how to use a word and image. So I don't feel like, oh, I'm teaching them something they're not going to use. I feel like I have to know all of it. So that's the one class. Um, then I have a portfolio class where <coughs> logo design and they put together an entire, you know, thing. That's like an upper level class, and that one's pretty challenging. But it is only a two year school, so, um, you know, it's not like the fourth year of a of a of a of a four year school. Mm. Although we do kind of load it on for a community college. It's a pretty good program, Bronx Community College, digital arts. Uh, as one who just recently yeah. graduated from a community college, kudos to work to you for working at one. They oh, are fantastic places. I agree. My son went to one. He went to Westchester Community College. It's a great school. He went. He got into SUNY Purchase, which is a super nice. great school. Yes. And he graduated from there. And a lot of my students go to SUNY Purchase. <laughs> So they, believe me, I have a student now who's like a web manager at Amazon. I mean, my students have done really well. You know, they're like, they make me look really like a, lo like a loser, some of them. So it's great. I love, community colleges rock. And we actually have to teach. You mm. know, we don't just like, oh, you know, we don't, we don't, we just roll up our sleeves and teach. And we're very uh, interactive with the students, me in particular. <laughs> Maybe yeah, too much. Yeah. That's wonderful. Interactive is definitely the way to go nowadays for teaching. It's a lot more effective than sort of the old school style. I, you know, you could get things online. What's the point of like going to school if you're just going to get somebody that's going to stand up there and go, you know? Turn to page 512 and read exactly. three chapters. And honestly, between you and me, I have no patience for people who take themselves too seriously. I mean, I don't treat my students like, oh, I'm better than you. I've been around longer than you. I know more than you. I treat my students like, oh, who are you? What's in your head? Oh, let's open up your brain. Oh, look at that. And it's fascinating. It's like every semester, all new faces show up, and I'm like, what is in there? You know, what are we going to find? And it's always something different. It's really exciting. Cool. Tiring. <laughs> Tiring. But exciting. Especially when your entire class is obsessed with Dr. Who. Oh, dear. Oh, yeah. Oh. They all graduated. Hi, Justin. <laughs> That's a dangerous topic to go down. <laughs> I could show you videos like you would not believe. They are. Oh, boy. I'm gonna miss those that crew. They were fun. Like, it was fun. <laughs> but there'll be some loonies to take their place. I'm sure. Yeah, there's always a new bunch to be entertained by. Oh yeah, and to exhaust me. I mean, <laughs> I'm glad I'm not. I'm not. You know, I'm teaching at an upper level, so usually I kind of know them when they come in. You know, and they know me, and that could be good or bad. <laughs> I smile a lot, but I'm also kind of a pain in the neck. I expect a lot too, you know. So. Let's see. Uh, we only have two questions left in the queue. Oh. Uh, the next one up would be: What advice to fellow writers and designers do you have in regards to the whole creation process that Whoa. you would be willing well, to offer? Um, should I answer this jointly for both? Because uh, I mean, however you like. I don't know. I think they're different. I think the difference is that you can make a living as a graphic designer. <laughs> you can't make a living as a writer. So if you're trying to choose between which one are you going to do to make a living in your life, go with the design. But you know, I don't see why you couldn't do both. To me, writing is a very um, rewarding activity. It's just not something you should go into because you think you're going to get rich doing it. You're not going to get rich doing design either, but you could actually make a reasonably okay living as a designer. I mean, it's a doable thing. It's a useful, it's something that society values and requires. You know, society doesn't really 
uh, I mean, yes, you could be a technical writer, I guess. I don't know, but okay. Writing is really something you have to do because you want to, not because you're expecting anything from it. Um, I, I think I got into it thinking, oh, wow, I'm going to become J.K. Rowling. Oh, yeah. And that was a really stupid thing to think because it's just, you can't recreate what somebody else does. You can't. It's like anything in the art. You know, design is an applied art. It's not the arts per se. I do think it deserves the respect of all arts because it is a fabulous thing, but it is an applied art. So you could realistically go into it and expect to make a living at it. There's no other reason why you would be doing it. You know, you can't. And you owe it to yourself to to learn what's necessary to be successful as a designer. Writing is really different. Writing is about self inward searching. What is my story? What do I have to say? What do I what story do I have to tell? And I firmly believe that every person has something unique to say. And I feel that way with design. That's why I never get bored in there because I feel like every student every student brings their own individual whatever their own perception, their background, their their persona, and their interests. And writing is the same thing. We all see a different angle. We're all so we're so much the same in terms of our emotions, but we're so different in the way we could could um, express that. So, as a writer, I think you need to first figure out what it is you want to say. Like you have something to say. You, you can't be writing from thinking, I'm going to write the next Fifty Shades of Grey and make a ton of money. I mean, you know, screw it if you're going to do that. You're going to write a piece of crap. And, you know, I'm sure for every person that decides they're going to do that, out of every 3,000, one person manages to strike it rich. But, you know, for, what do they get? You know, what are they getting? Are they getting any satisfaction? So that's the advice I would give to writers. First of all, read a lot in your genre. Pick your genre that you like. You know, you can't just write in a genre you don't know. If you don't read romance novels, you shouldn't be writing romance novels. I will never write a romance novel because I will never read a romance novel. I hate romance. No offense. That doesn't mean I don't put romance in my books. There's always romance in my book. But a romance novel has a very particular kind of formula and trope, and I'm not dissing people who love it or people who write it. That's great. And the people who write it generally love to read it. I started writing young adult because, well, obviously I'm not particularly mature. And secondly, I like reading the stuff a lot. It's like the, the plots move really quickly. They're character driven, but they're quick. I don't have a very long attention span. You know, I'll read a book like The Goldfinch. I'll, I started reading The Goldfinch, which is a big bestseller, and I'm like, Oh, <laughs> I just can't, I can't, cannot read that stuff. I'm a story person. So I read a lot of the stuff that I want to write. And, you know, I will tell you that when I first started writing, I had not, I had no clue what I was doing. I just started barfing out things, and it was ridiculous. There was nothing. It was just garbage, because I had no idea who I was writing for, what I was doing, you know. So... You have to be a reader to be a writer. You have to. You can't be in a rush. You can't be writing because you think you're going to get rich. You can't have a thin skin. You better be willing to take uh, criticism, constructive criticism. But you better know who to put yourself around. Don't be around people who are just obnoxious and want to cut you down. You, you need to choose your critique partners well. Make sure that they have, um, you know, I mean, I could talk about that. If you would like me to tell you how I actually started writing, I think it's interesting. You want me to? Yeah, by all means. Well, as I said, I started writing not that long after 9-11, and I had a very, very ridiculous reason for starting writing, because I wanted to illustrate something. Back to illustration. I wanted to have a book to illustrate. I wanted to do a children's picture book. So I actually got a grant from my college to do this picture book. I did all this, you know, I sketched out this whole story idea. I did all these drawings. I'm drawing, I'm drawing, I'm writing, I'm writing. And at one point, after about a year, 
I looked at my art, I looked at my writing, and I said, I, I'm writing for the wrong audience here. I'm dark and creepy, and my art is not. Uh-oh, I can't do this. I'm not a picture book artist. No way. So I just kind of, you know, I learned a lot by trial and error. And I wrote, I think, for two, my cousin Mark. Hi, Mark. He's the first, and my friend Joanne. They read the first thing I wrote, and they still, they, they met together at my release party, and they talked to each other, and they're like, oh, that was the best thing you ever wrote. And I'm like, you guys, that was terrible. But I wrote something for two years in a spiral notebook, and it was the most meandering, weird, ridiculous, crazy flight of fancy thing. I couldn't even tell you what the genre was. You know, it had no, no, nothing. It was madness. And it was awful. And a friend of mine actually knew a top editor at um, one of the big publishing houses. And I had it all typed up, and she let her read it. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> and I get, like, six weeks go by, and she gets back to me, and she tells my friend, she goes, tell her not to quit her day job. So, I mean, I was just like, shot. <laughs> but you know what? At that point, I said, okay, you know what? I don't know what I'm doing. I have to find help. I have to get out there and find help. And it didn't occur to me in my idiocy that maybe I should take a writing class. This just didn't come into my head. I don't know why. Instead, I went on Google, and I typed in critique groups, children's writing. <laughs> and I ended up on the SCBWI web, uh, website, and there was this posting for critique group forming online. So I joined it. I didn't look into the people. I didn't know anything. I joined it. Nine women writing completely different genres. But let me tell you something. Some of these women on there taught me how to write. And then I went on to form other critique groups and other critique groups. And there are people out there who they know who they are were probably largely responsible for educating me on how to write. We just read each other's stuff. We ripped it apart. We don't do it that much anymore because we've kind of all gotten published, and you know we don't need as much um, early support. We tend to need more read-throughs, beta mm -hmm. readers, they're called. Yep. So I tend to be a little more random about those. I'll just find, you want a beta read? Okay. You know. But when I first started, I needed like hand holding. I needed somebody to read like a chapter at a time and go, that's flat, that's boring, there's no tension, you're showing, you're not you're you're telling, you're not showing, you know, your dialogue is stilted. So that's where you start. You start learning your craft. And you, you know, now these days with self publishing so easily done. Don't rush out there with crappy writing and a crappy cover and think you're going to become famous. Take your sweet time and try to go traditional at first because they're the gatekeepers. And if you are lousy, they will well, they'll probably ignore you. But if you're so-so, you might get some really good feedback that you could that you could keep applying. You know, mm -hmm. so just don't be in a big rush. And don't don't do it because you think you're going to make a killing. Don't do it for that. You know, do it because you want to. You have something to say, and you want to reach other people and engage them, and you want your story in their head. All right. I think that's the reason to do it. You guys agree? Yeah. Uh, one of the main reasons that I keep on working on my stories, although I have to work on the finishing part of that process, mm -hmm. is because I have stories. <laughs> I want to share with others. Exactly. They really entertain me, and I think they're cool. Mm -hmm. Even if no one else would, right. I still want to write them. I agree with you, and that's how you know you're a writer. Because, you know, when you have reject, you get a lot of rejection in writing, a lot of it, you know. And um, you just, you know, there's been so many times when I, you know, I would, like, email my critique group. They're called the Kudos. I go, I'm going to give up writing. I suck. The world hates me. Ah! And then, and then I would just like run myself out, and they go, "Okay, you down from the ledge yet?" They go, "Do you want to write?" They go, "No." Yeah. They go, "Okay, you're a writer. Just keep writing. Shut up." <laughs> <laughs> and that's basically what it is. It's like if somebody said to you, "You're never gonna get published, but you have to stop writing," would you 
want to stop writing? Probably not. No. You would just keep doing it. So uh, my feeling is if that's how you feel, if you feel that writing is something that you've got to do because you've got stories to tell, you got to keep doing it. And it doesn't really matter if you're published, you're not published, you're, you're published by you know Scholastic or you're self-published. You know what? If you have successfully told your story in a way that um, somebody else could experience it and it, 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 it reaches them and changes them in a way, then you're a writer. You know? And for me, writing, I'm a very visual person. So when I first started writing, it was like I I would see these things in my mind and I I just like I didn't know how to find the words for them, you know? I just I saw it. So it's like for me, writing has been an exercise in sort of taking notes on what's going on in my head. You know? Mm -hmm. And that that I feel like the better I'm able to do that. Um, the better of a writer I'm becoming. And I feel like I'm still learning. You know, it's really exciting. I like a challenge. Yeah, it seems like there's always something more to learn. Totally. There's always more stories to tell. I used to think, oh, I'm going to run out of stories. And I'm, I could tell you, you want to hear a funny story about how ideas come to me? Hmm. Do you? Yeah. I'm not boring you? Not at all. Okay. Well, I have an agent who I... I think is fabulous. She's my third agent. And I think, you know what? It's like Goldilocks. This one is to this, and this one is to that, and this one is just right. I think I found just right. You know, she's like the perfect blend of business-minded, direct, focused, but also a good editor, you know, and she's a good balance for me. And we work really well together. And she knows when to kind of calm me down and shut me up. So she was waiting for me to finish something that I just, that's actually on submission now, which is called The Garden of the Lost. And it's a mashup of The Secret Garden. I'm really excited about it. And uh, it's not like a horror at all. It's really more of a kind of a warped fantasy. And it's from a girl's point of view. And it's unsold at the moment. Anyway, so she really, Shannon is her name, Shannon Hassan, my agent. Um, with my Hawaiian Literary, really great agency. Very fortunate to be with them. Um, she um, she wanted me to focus. She's like, "Come on, you know, you got to work on these. Get this done. Finish the manuscript." And I'm like, "It's May, you know." And in my life, May. This was back in May. May is when all hell breaks loose in my job. I call it mm -hmm. mayhem. It's like finals and budgets, and I'm like. Who in their right mind would give a person like me an Excel spreadsheet and ask them to add th things up? But this is what happens for me. Like, I'm doing that. I'm dealing with students. They're, they're like, dropping down like ninjas everywhere I go. And I'm walking into the campus, and I call Shannon. I'm like, Shannon, I have a new idea. And she's like, come on now. You're crazy. She goes, calm down. You're like, how could you be thinking of a new idea? I said, I don't know. It just came to me, and I had to tell you what it is. And that's how it goes. Mm. You want to know what it is? What was that? You want to know what the idea is? I do. I just, this kid popped into my head. You know, I will tell you that I have had experience with people with learning disabilities. Actually, one of my kids, you know, had gone to a special needs. So I was around these really bright kids with so-called special needs. And I always thought, God, I wanted to write a story set in school like that where these kids are supposedly, have, you know, they have issues, but they're really super smart. And, um, and I just thought of this kid that was obsessed with the Dada movement, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so that's why. Probably me in the art history. I thought, mm -hmm. what is this, this kid who goes to a special needs school and he's obsessed with the Dada movement and he thinks he's, he's Marcel Duchamp and he calls himself that. And then he has to solve a murder. And I called her, and I told her that. She goes, okay. I said, we're going to call the absurdist. She goes, okay, don't write that now. Finish the one you're doing. So that's actually the next thing I'm going to write. Nice. So you want to know where my story ideas come from? That was me walking to get my coffee at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning in the Bronx, thinking about finals, and that thing pops into my head. So I don't know. There's no explanation. I'm just nuts. Yeah, so <laughs> in my thought process, and Calvin can attest to that because I bounce most of my ideas off of him. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. It kind of just happens, right? We're just wired that way. Mm. We're not we're not wired to function like, you know, just doing normal things. We need we I think it's like spill off, right? Yeah. It's like you know, it's not enough to just, oh, I'm going grocery shopping, I'm going to the store. Oh, wow, what if that guy walking down the street was a serial killer? Oh, yeah, you know, oh, <laughs> got to get tomatoes. You know. Yeah, pretty much. That's how my life goes, basically. <laughs> got to make a doctor's appointment. Oh, wow, what about that idea? Yeah. Sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> it's alarming that this is on the Internet right now and... Bearing my soul, but you know what? Anybody who's watching this who already knows me is totally not surprised by any of this. And anybody who doesn't know me, that's what you get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after 53 episodes, if people are watching this and are surprised by our activities... Well, you guys are pretty tame, <laughs> I think. Probably what goes on behind your skulls is a lot crazier than what you're presenting. <laughs> See, probably my my skull is just very blank, and you know, I just act crazy, but there's been nothing back there. It's just like mm. daisies. I think we're also a little slow because it's a Sunday afternoon, and we're all scattered across New England. If we're all in the same room together, and you give us caffeine, all bets are off. Ah, that sounds fun. There are other <laughs> things besides caffeine that help facilitate our craziness. Crazy conference somewhere. That'll that'll be next weekend. You guys, you guys go to conferences, right? I just went to like a really crazy conference. I couldn't keep up with the crazy. I was like out crazy. <laughs> I just couldn't do it. I was like, I gotta do this. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not really truly geeky enough. <laughs> I went to PyCon. You heard of that one? It's very small. Uh, I've heard the name. In Connecticut. Hmm. The really crazy one is that Aresia. You probably go to that one, right? I want to go to that one, but I haven't managed to get to well, it yet. The really crazy one is Comic Con, New York, and that one's too crazy for old me. I went to that one once. That was sensory overload. Yeah, it's not even fun. It's too much. It's not intimate. You can't really interact with people. It's just too much. Mm -hmm. I kind of prefer. has a nice mix. I preferred Book Expo because that's basically Comic Con, but for. Oh, BEA. Yeah. That's my oh that's my that's camp for me. That's like Lisa <laughs> Camp. I, that's like we all talk about that all year. We have a Facebook page. Are you going to BEA twenty fourteen? You know, mm -hmm. I went to three in a row. It is. It's the funnest thing. It's totally like, you know, Willy Wonka's chocolate factory for, you know, writers. It's just mm -hmm. wonderful. I love it. And that's where we met so many people from Spencer Hill Press. Well you didn't meet you. Yeah. You didn't meet me. Yeah, we what? did. Yes, we did. You did? You met yes. me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Both of us did. I really met. <laughs> we actually met. Did I sign you a, a poster? Yes. Oh, I believe so. Yes, you did. I did. Ha! Huh. Well, that's where you met oh. us. Yeah. It was nuts. Hold oh, on a second. You came, you came there, I think, during BookCon, right? Uh, yeah, I think we met most of you all that day. Because but... BookCon was insanity. It was that like, was we, crazy. What was oh my god, usually last year it was like really relaxed, we had a lot of traffic, but it was never like we felt like short order cooks or something. <laughs> this was like, we were like short order cooks, <gasps> god, look at the poster, <gasps> you know, it was like, it was crazy. We never, that never happened to us before. So that was, that was pretty nuts. <laughs> ah, so we did meet. Look at, look at yep. Embarrassing. So you know how, you know, you know what we're like. <laughs> <laughs> and we've already had, um, oh, who was it? Uh, Eric Nunnally on. Oh, on hi, previous Eric. episode. Eric, Eric, I did Eric's cover. That was a very yeah. scary experience. <laughs> Eric's like a really good designer. And I'm like, dude, why am I doing your cover? Why, why? I'm so nervous. Well, it's a really yeah, nice cover. Yeah. What? It's a really nice cover. Thank you. It was it was nerve wracking doing his cover. It was alarming and scary because he he's just like I'm not used to doing covers for other graphic designers. Are fine. Hey, yeah, there's that poster. Like I'm still traumatized. By it. it's, <laughs> it's really nice. I actually met him for the first time at a uh, fair. 
you know, and I always had him do my cover, but then he was busy, and I just said, oh, okay, I'll do my own. So. There's the poster of book covers. Hmm? Oh, yeah, you got it. And I did I actually sign it? Yep. Ooh. Yes. Look at that. There it is. That's my beautiful signature. <laughs> <laughs> Look at it closely, people. Easy to forge. <laughs> Very zero waste. <laughs> you have any more questions? Uh, I the last one that I have is just where can people find you, like your website or your social media. But if anyone else on the crew has any last minute questions they'd like to surprise you with, now is your chance. I'm having fun. This is like a hangout. It's like, you know, it's been kind of dull up here. You know? <laughs> well, see how thrilling it is. Just my husband meandering around there, probably thinking, where's dinner? <laughs> What's on his mind? Where's the soup? Did you make the soup? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, notice there are no children here. Yeah. Because they have grown and they have blown. My daughter's actually she lives at home during the during the rest of the year, but she's in the city this summer. She's working. My son is like well uh, him. Yeah. Okay. I should tell you about him. You want to find his website? Let me give a shout out for my son who never calls his mother. Ben Zank Photography. Twenty six almost twenty six thousand likes on his Facebook page. It's nice. gotten to the point where my students know him. And they have said to me, it, this happened to me at Comic-Con. One of my students came, and I showed him this picture of my son and this other student who ran into him on the street. And he looks at me and he goes, you're Ben Zank's mother? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that'll get his attention. Yeah, he's, he's 23. He moved out this summer. and. He's, you know, being a big shot. That's okay. It's fine. That's what you raise him for, right? Mm -hmm. Good mm -hmm. Anyway, where can you find me? LisaAmowitz.com is my uh, website. Within there is a blog, which actually is, could be reached in a separate way. It's kind of embedded in there. Thank you, Elizabeth, for helping me fix that. It's Elizabeth Langston, my fellow author and uh Computer geek. <laughs> um, that was really cool. I didn't even talk about that. I we had a co-writing experience. If you want, you could ask me about that. Cause I'd like to talk about that. But where to find me? Uh, LisaAmos.com. There's a blog embedded in there, uh, which I have recently decided I need to dust off. And I will be posting. Elizabeth and I are going to be posting a series of uh, posts about our really amazing co-authoring experience that we are currently engaged in, um, which I could talk about if you want. But I'm on Twitter, Lisa underscore Amowitz, at Lisa underscore Amowitz. Uh, Facebook, author, Lisa Amowitz author. Um, I have a Tumblr, but it's kind of ridiculous. And all I do is post things about Benedict Cumberbatch, because I said I wasn't going to say anything, but I can't help myself. Because <laughs> I'm a Cumberbatch. <laughs> babe. <laughs> <laughs> babe, babe. In fact, I'm so much of a cumber babe that I'm going to see Hamlet next summer. Hi girls. Oh, nice. They're all watching me now, I think. My cumber girls. I have a whole <laughs> bunch of friends. It's pathetic. I know. Too old for this. <laughs> so you're 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 a standard issue Tumblr user. No, I'm not. I don't I'm really not the kind of girl lady that does a lot of Tumblr esque things. I will occasionally go, here's something. Mostly I do put like I'm really not a good Tumblr person. I have very few followers. I suck at Tumblr. I'm trying to get people to help me be better on Tumblr. But I'm on Twitter a lot, more than anything. Twitter's my thing. Facebook, eh. I mean, I, I message people on Facebook a lot. Mm -hmm. Like, it's mostly, it's my method of communication. So, I don't know if I'm, that's where I am. Okay. Yeah, it seems like everyone has one preferred social media method for just interacting with people. It's kind of yeah. hard to do all of them. Well, I think if you're really, um, I think.
think what it is is t Twitter, you're like actually having conversations with people. You could possibly, like somebody could answer mm -hmm. you. And I like that. I like that engagement, you know. Um, Facebook is like, I don't know. It's, your, it's just your network of your own friends, so it doesn't really reach that many people. Whereas t Twitter, if you hashtag it right, you could reach people that, you know, you don't really know, and you could just sort of jump in on any conversation and meet interesting people. Like, I don't really spend a lot of time on it. Like, I don't go on Twitter all day long. I'll, I'll schedule posts <coughs> stuff. You know, I'll schedule posts. But this summer, it's Twitter for me. I guess some other times it's Facebook. I'm, I'm really not very organized about this stuff or very good at it. <laughs> I'm trying. You're in good company. <laughs> it's exhausting. I don't think anybody claims to be an expert at it. You know, if they otherwise do claim, I think they're wrong. What? If they do claim to be an expert, I think they're wrong. Yeah, because that's probably all they're doing. And it's, as the son tells me, my son, he... The so-called, you know, he is actually kind of a Facebook expert. And what he tells me, his piece of advice when he deigns to give me any, is he goes, it's about the content. That was his word of wisdom. It's all about content. Content. you got to put content out there. You can't just shout about things. Yeah, content is king. And I think he's right. You know, it's hard mm -hmm. to do. That's why I've decided to sort of dust off my blog and bring out my blogging hat and just talk about things in more depth rather than just go, hey, buy my book, hey, buy my book, hey, you know, it's boring. Mm -hmm. well, should, should I keep talking or should I shut up now? Does anyone have any other questions? Um, you covered most, you've covered most of my uh, design questions, so... <laughs> Uh, we can I would always... like to remember more about MacBook Pro, but we can do that another time. <laughs> <laughs> we can always be dangerous, and if you have any questions for us. Um, yeah, you, this is a lot of work, you guys. Is it uh, rewarding for you? You get a lot out of it? You enjoy it? Uh, yes. Yeah. It's been a lot <laughs> of fun. Mm -hmm. Why do you do it mostly? What's your thing? What's your reason for doing it? Uh, it, it was initially, the whole idea was, I want to do a show about literary topics or just whatever mm -hmm. random arguments we have about writing, mm -hmm. but I don't want to do it by myself, because mm. monologues are a bit silly. Yeah. <laughs> and then I thought, well, what if I asked my friends to join me? Mm -hmm. And then it was trying to schedule things, and it just didn't happen until I got to the point where I went, you know what, we're doing this, mm -hmm. here's, the here's the time, we're doing it, it's happening, and then no one else showed up. <laughs> 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 I it's think a... it's really cool. I mean, I think, um, I didn't really get what it was. I probably should have looked a little uh, closer. Uh, to be fair, 54 episodes in, and it just keeps on changing, so trying to explain what we do is never that easy. Well, it's like a talk show. Pretty much. Visual talk show. Because, I mean, I've been interviewed on podcasts before, but they were always just voice. It would just be a bunch of people yakking on the phone. <laughs> you wouldn't see it. So that's what I was thinking it was going to be. It was just like this, only it was just voices. Mm. And they're still up there somewhere. Me being equally ridiculous, but just, you know, you wouldn't see me being ridiculous. So... I think it's really cool. I like it. Yeah, I find the video podcast style a little easier to work with because you can see the other people. You can react to yeah. their reactions. You can like engage it. what they're doing. I feel like we're just hanging out here. It's like we're just having a chat. It's really fun. It's better than Skype because the picture's clear. Mm. <laughs> and then we can make fun of people if they're not paying attention because you can see them on their camera. If they're going to make fun of me after you get off the air. Oh, shit! Oh, shit! was crazy. She's the craziest person we ever had on here. But look at this beautiful view she's got. <laughs> you are actually one of the more normal people we've had on this show. Uh, well, yeah. I guess I could give that impression, sort of, for five minutes. <laughs> Can I do one thing before I go? Can I give a plug for something that I'm working on right now? 
No, oh, by all means. I, by all means. Not. I just want to talk about an experience that I had. Um, what's today's date? I guess it was almost two weeks ago. It was the July twenty seventh. Um, I want to. I'm actually co-writing a book, and this is a very new experience for me and my friend that I'm doing. With. We are both authors of Spencer Hill Press, um, and I actually got to know Elizabeth um, through um, doing her covers. I did three of her covers, and we just got we just kind of clicked, and we're just so different. I mean, we are just like opposites of each other. She's the southern computer girl who was in the military, and you know, and I'm this crazy New York woman, and you know, we're just like if you looked at the two of us, you go, what do you two even have in common? And I said, God, Elizabeth, we're like a Venn diagram. You're like the left, I'm the right, and then there's this overlap where we're just like exactly the same. So it was like so cool. And we both found out that we were really into the Revolutionary War period <laughs> because her books are set in um, the 18th century. She's, she's a wonk. She knows all this history stuff. And I will confess to you that for about four years, and you might relate to this being, you guys in Connecticut? Who's in Connecticut? Raise your hand. Uh, Raise your most Connecticut. of us. Uh, so you must know this man. You must know good old Nathan Hale personally, right? You know him, right? Uh, we haven't met yet. But, but he's, in your, he's from your state. Who lives near Coventry? Anyone? Coventry? 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 <laughs> Coventry? Anybody? No? no? I don't know. I, I live in New York, so that's, oh. that's kind of foreign to me. Okay. Well, you see, the thing about Nathan Hale is that nobody's interested in him. They're like, oh, God. They just fall asleep when they hear that. But me being crazy, I got interested in him from studying uh, history with my daughter. And I realized that he was 21 years old and he was hanged as a spy. And I thought, wow, hmm. I didn't know that. A spy? He, what was he doing? So anyway, to make a long story short... Elizabeth and I started watching this show called Turn, which was just, you ever hear that? It was on AMC. It just came mm. on this past spring. She, my mother told me about it because of me and my Nathan Hale thing. And um, she goes, you got to watch Turn. So I said, Elizabeth, you got to watch Turn. So we started watching Turn. And they were like, they didn't say anything about Nathan Hale. <laughs> he was a spy. <laughs> and we got really annoyed. So I said to her, I said, you're interested in Nathan Hale? <laughs> <laughs> like usually the reaction when I say that is like, oh god, I'm feeling so tired right now. <laughs> People just are like, um, excuse me, I need to go to the bath. Like no interest. But Elizabeth was like, yeah, damn, I am. So, yeah, that's kind of weird. So we decided, wow, that's really cool. So believe it or not, I am staying on a street on a road. It's called Old Albany Post Road in, uh, I'm not going to say the town, but it's it's a very old piece of road. It's dirt. And Georgia boy, Washington, kind of went by here with a horse mm -hmm. a few times. <laughs> now, not, not Nathan, but I said, you know, Elizabeth, you come up here. We're going to be in a really historic area. We can start doing this thing. So she did. She came up. And we're going to be blogging about how we're writing this book. And I know it sounds incredibly boring, but it's a it's a paranormal. <laughs> it's a YA paranormal. It's a, a romance, and it involves Nathan Hale. Not boring. I'm intrigued. That sounds pretty exciting, actually. Hmm. It's we have a name too. I don't know if I should give it away, but it's a really good name. <laughs> but one life. It's good. So stay tuned because she is a really good writer. She wrote uh, Whisper Falls and um, A Whisper in Time and Whispers from the Past. And I, di I didn't do the first cover, but hopefully I'm going to get to redo it for her. And, um, and I'm really excited about the whole thing because it's fun. Hard, hard work. Like really, oh my God. You could follow on the blog. You can see <laughs> what we did. Oh. It, was in it was intense. All right, have I worn you guys out? Because I've worn myself out. Have you had enough of me yet? Uh. <laughs> no, we're, we're pretty used to just keep on rolling and rolling until okay. it all is off now. Mm -hmm. 
We'll keep this train rolling all day if we have to. Yeah. Oh, uh, all well, right. if, well, if we don't, yeah, if somebody doesn't stop us. <laughs> well, you guys could talk. Most... I'm tired. <laughs> I <hear> my own voice. <laughs> Unless you want to ask some more questions, I don't know if I have anything else to say. Uh, what was that, Justin? Oh, I was saying we've reached the hundred minute mark. Huh. Oh. Kind of awesome. Awesome. Okay. Didn't you guys have things that you do after the interviewer run viewee yeah. runs out of things to talk about? Yeah, we have just the one other talking point for the group and highlights real our writing prompts for the week, weekly goals, events, all the usual stuff. You're welcome to stay with us for those if you'd like. Okay, I'll hang out, but I'm gonna just kinda sit back here. Let That's go. fine. All right, no problem. I think I've bored the internet enough. <laughs> and myself. I was doing that automatic nodding in agreement of whatever you said, and when you said, <laughs> I'm quit boring the internet, I'm like, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, wait, no, I'm not supposed to nod that. You know, <laughs> it's like, how about you just ramble on about yourself so much, you know? It's like you get to feel, like, ridiculous after a while. It's like, enough about me already. Well, not that interesting. We've been doing that for 53 episodes and going, so... Yeah, but it's interesting <laughs> to you, because you're not me. <laughs> I'd rather hear about you. I'm sick of me. <laughs> I'm with me all the time. <laughs> well, let's see. We only had the one talking point for the week, because I only came up with one. Hey, why don't we write a story together? All of us? Yeah! Let's get crazy. That would well, be what do you guys write? What what genres do you write? What what wait, Charles? What do you write? Uh, primarily sci-fi. Sci-fi, adult or quote unquote, not not teen, older. Um, what writers do you like? See, I'll interview you guys. There you go. What what do you like? What what are your favorite writers? If we go favorite, then it tends to lead more towards fantasy, like mm -hmm. uh, old school David Eddings, and mm -hmm. I'll go with the classic Tolkien because. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of hard not to. Are you into Are you into the Hobbit movies? Not really. No. They're a little slow, right? Did you like the Lord of the Ring movies? Um, for the movies, I like them as movies. Mm -hmm. Trying to overlay them to the books, I feel weird. It doesn't really seem to work well. Yeah. So you're a real uh, what's the word? Uh, weird. Orthodox. Orthodox Tolkienite. I would say that would be a, that was a big influence for me. Not that it shows up in my work at all, but I I grew up on those things and I was obsessed with them. Okay, let's see. Listen to last week's episode for my long-winded tirade about how the Fellowship of the Ring is not a good book. Not a good book. I mean, you know, it's it's le it's long-winded. You know, it really. I, you know, it's like anything else. If you were to I think it depends when you read something, how it affects you, you know, and, and I think it, it has to be at the time when you, I don't know how to explain this, if I'm saying this correctly, but I think that a lot of what is uh, um, significant is about timing, like what the work, who it hits at what time, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I know people say terrible things about Twilight, and if I were, like, if I read it now for the first time, after all that I know about writing and all that I've read, I would probably go, oh! But, you know, I picked it up in late 2000 and, I don't know, when did I read it? Like 2006 or something? Before I really read a lot of YA, you know, and before there was a lot of stuff that was out like that, and it was like, wow! You know? <laughs> <laughs> for me at the time. Mm. So I think for me reading Tolkien when I was 16 or something was like, wow, it was mind-bending, you know? Not everything stands up over the years like Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah. I think as a kid, the order of series was The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe series oh. was the first. Mm -hmm. Then David Edding's... Uh, two quintologies, and then I got to the Hobbit and Fellowship of the Rings. Hmm. How old were you when you when you were reading those? Uh, 
see, that would have been third grade. So third a, lot grade. Of it, a lot of it went over my head. Third grade. Kind of third, wait, you were reading Tolkien in third grade? Uh, no, third grade was uh, C.S. Lewis, and then fourth wait, and fifth was heading. Two? Yeah, two and a half. How old are you now? Ten? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> don't tell me, don't tell me. It's okay. Ten and three quarters. Well, I did you guys ever read Asimov when you were um, kids, or now, or ever? Uh, that was more as a teenager for me. Yeah, I would say those books were really big for me. I Robot and all that stuff. Oh, and you know, if I have to pick a book that I think really did something to me when I was a kid, it would have to be. Um, wait, he wrote Stranger in a Strange Land, right? Wasn't that him? I think so. I, that book. That book was like, like, earth shaking for me. Like, I think it's still in me somewhere. And the interview with the vampire books. <laughs> but you know, for me, I'm I'm pretty up there. So those books were kind of new. <laughs> I think I was more of a Ray Bradbury fan than an Asimov fan. Oh, I loved him too. Another book, um, the the Golden Apples of the Sun, and there will come soft frames. Oh my God, oh my God, that was like, oh my God. I should probably read and Kurt Vonnegut. I should probably go back and read that stuff again. I don't know. It's like I just haven't go back, gone back to it. But that stuff was really huge for me. As a matter of fact, I read a lot of fantasy as a kid, and then I just stopped. Like I totally went cold turkey for a long time. And I think, Harry, believe it or not, Harry Potter kind of got me back into it. But I think there was like 20 years there where I just didn't like fantasy at all. I don't know why. Hmm. What do you, what, so you like, wait, what's the other guy's name there? The orange shirt guy? No, Justin. Somebody who's sitting there that hasn't said a word. Is he the techie guy? <laughs> He's the one who's secretly grading us and will detail all of our mistakes and oh, shenanigans no. afterwards. Asking me on the show, that could be... Or he's been on mute this whole oh, time. Yeah, I I oh, Justin, you're Justin. Yes. What do, you, what do you, you... So you write more like psychological thriller? Psychological horror and fantasy. Yeah. I mean, I would say that's kind of what I... That's me. More psych, sort of both. That's kind of what I did. Yeah. And what are your favorite books? I haven't been doing a whole lot of reading. Uh, unfortunately, So what happened... My... My childhood has dictated my inability to read books. Uh, so growing up, I got into uh, R.L. Stein, uh, Goosebumps and whatnot. Of course. And then I, I quickly jumped over to some of the darker stuff, like the Fear Street series. Um, like who? Uh, still R.L. Stein, but he has a series of books, uh, Fear Street. Oh, which is no. Like more, like, grotesque. Oh, so you, you like the real, real horror stuff? Like, you like to see movies like Saw? Yes, I'm not proud of that fact. See, and that's where I the just first, don't... The, the first Saw I found was good, and then the rest of them were terrible. Um, I am also the same person who watched Human Centipede, but we won't get into that. Uh, and then I... About probably the end of elementary school to middle school... Uh, I think I got a hold of Stephen King, and I held on tightly for probably a decade mm. and read just about every single thing. In fact, I might have read every single thing since before he moved to Florida. Oh, my God. I can't believe my husband is vacuuming now. You hear that? He's vacuuming. I don't know why. why? Yeah, we're kind of used to that. We always have background noise of some I think sort. Must have been I was done by now, and you just suddenly had this urge to vacuum. <laughs> um, it's a good thing I'm not in my apartment because you would be deafening. You wouldn't be able to hear me at all. Uh, uh, okay, so what was I going to say about what you said there? Stephen King. You know, I the story that I also read read from him that affected me the most is not his usual uh, stuff. It's uh, Stand by Me. I would say. If there's a book that kind of captures the vibe of my book of Breaking Glass, yeah, it's, it's that uh, book, Stand By Me. That's it. I think that I was sort of channeling that book. I can see that. I love that book. I love that movie. So good. 
just like just regular people thrown into something really unexpectedly creepy. Yes. And that's what I love. I love that. I, that's where I'm, I'm always, I guess, and you know, if we're like, you know, aren't, don't we live our lives kind of a, always sort of afraid? <laughs> so it's like a good way of just kind of, you know, mastering that. Afraid, but then also fascinated with the macabre and then a lot of poking things with sticks to see what happens. I think we all have that in us. Yeah, because it's like if it's like you know like when you, I mean you know you guys probably weren't playing with Barbies, but you probably played with your weird toys or whatever, and you know it's just fear mastering, you know. I think, but I don't know. I guess for me, a lot of it is also um, trying to understand people. <laughs> You know, and putting them in situations and figuring out what they'll do and how they'll react. And it's, uh, I think that's the theatrical side of me because I think I do have some kind of weird sense for creating characters that just kind of become alive in my head. Mm -hmm. like I'm not an actress, but I could kind of make these people up and play their part. So it's also like play acting, right? A little bit? Yeah, I would say that. Yeah. Thankfully, uh, I got CJ to take me uh, old used paperback shopping where I went and started grabbing a whole bunch of random books without any care in the world, and I'm starting to go through those now. I'm trying to get back into reading and widening my, my breadth of authors and stories instead yeah. of just being the Stephen King guy. Oh, yeah. You, you can't just read one guy, one person. I mean, you know. No, it's been terrible for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I guess, I mean, I understand fixating. Lord knows I understand that. I'm a fixator. And, um, you know, I, I just, sometimes I, I just wish I could just force myself. I, I, I don't know. One, one person I really suggest that you all read if you're not really into, um, I wouldn't say young adult, but like if you want to read a nice mashup of genre mixing, did you guys ever read anything by Neil Gaiman? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Good Omens and um, the other book that I'm now blanking on the name of. Good Omens is actually next on my list of books to read. Have you ever read the Graveyard book or Coraline? I have the graveyard book in my, in one of the five piles of books mm. that I need to read. Well, I just finished one that's like supposedly an adult book. It's called um, The Ocean at the End of the Lane. And that, that book is really fabulous. I mean, just so good. He is so good. Mm. He is like, I just want to be him. <laughs> like, I just, I want to be him. I want to be Maggie Stiefvater. I want to take these people and I want to like just take their brains and put them in my head. Cause that's who I, those are the people that do what I want to do. Like they just create re normal people with full range of emotions and put them in these extraordinary situations that feel natural, that don't feel like contrived. You know? Mm. He he's really yeah he's superb, beautiful writer. The Graveyard Book's a kid's book, and I'm telling you, man, it's about as dark as it gets. And it's middle grade. So I'm like, figure, okay, if he could get away with that. <laughs> yeah, I worship that guy. Oh, God. You are not alone. Did you guys ever watch um, or read Neverwhere? I've been meaning to. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. I've heard nothing but good things, though. Lady Doom. <laughs> it's so cool. There is, well, there's a connection. There's a Cumberbatch connection, which is kind of why I got into it, because there's a, a radio version where he plays the angel. And it's like, I'm listening to this, and you hear the wings going, <laughs> flapping wings, and his voice. And it's so creepy, you know? And I 
in my searching about London, going to London, I realized there is actually a thing called the Angel Islington. It is a thing in London. It's a place. The Angel is Islington. <laughs> so cool. Just leave it to Neil Gaiman to pick out like things that are ordinary from his world and twist them completely around into something really bizarre. That's what he does so well. <sighs> Running out of steam here. <laughs> I out talked you guys, huh? Unbelievable. Like, talk out, winner! <laughs> yeah, usually as the leader, I have to fill in all the quiet parts, but... Yeah, but I took over. Yay. Yeah, damn fine job you did. God help anybody who's take... quiet around me. I'm just, yeah. <laughs> it's just water, too, I'm telling you. Just this water in here. There's nothing else. <laughs> That's what they all say. Huh? <laughs> That's what they all say. Just, hey, you don't believe it's me? It's just water. What do you think I'm drinking here? Straight vodka? I mean, seriously. <laughs> Are you? Tequila Wait a minute, he might be. What do you got there? That looks a little suspicious. <laughs> I don't know what you have there. <laughs> what do you have? Hmm. My door. My bedroom door is closed. There, and there's it writing is. on it. What's the writing say? Come on, put it closer. Uh, 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 uh. Is that some vodka? Oh, it says Axor. <laughs> Oh, it's a, it's a random, it's a random uh, hoity-toity furniture shop in Manhattan. <laughs> Is that furniture polish? What are you drinking? <clears throat> oh, it's just regular. Wait, are you are you in there? Are you in New York? Where yep, I'm in New York? York. I'm in Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Yes. Well, in the Bronx, usually. Yeah, if, <clears throat> Bronx is Bronx is unfortunately like might as well be another uh, like two states away from me. <laughs> I know, I know. People don't seem to understand that non-New Yorkers they don't they don't get us how we roll. They don't get that we do not go to each other's boroughs. We all just meet in Manhattan. Basically. Although lately, the rest of us kind of decided that Brooklyn might be cool. And it yeah, make, that's right. Make random forays there, you know, like mm -hmm, go to Brooklyn. Like nobody comes to the Bronx unless they have to. <laughs> and the place where nobody goes, we know what place that is, right? Come on, mm -hmm. out with it. What's the part of New York? Nobody goes. Staten Island. Yay! <laughs> Staten Island 500. <laughs> All right. Yes. <laughs> nobody goes there. And when Hurricane Sandy almost washed it away, we were like, oh, I forgot about that place. Damn forgot it. that was there. <laughs> Stop it. Damn it. That's the part of the city? Oh. <laughs> Why would anybody go there? Yeah. Like, and then there's Queens. Uh, uh, yeah. Queens is Queens is yeah. Queens is starting to come up a little bit in the world. Like, yeah. like yeah. A, 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 basically a story in Long Island City. A story is pretty cool, actually. Oh, there's a really nice bookstore in a story. Have you ever heard of Enigma Books? Um, I have not. You should go check it out. It's small, but they're really nice there. I was actually at a um, a panel with some of the Spencer Hill people, and um, I'm going to reach out to them. Oh, can I just give a shout-out for myself about stuff that's going on this fall? Go for it. Oh. Did you, where'd you go? The internet oh. said no shout-out. Oh. Yeah, that's a negative. So either the internet cut out, or maybe she didn't have a power cord on. Oh, there we go. Is the show over? I thought you booted me no. out. No, no, no. Sometimes oh. it just gets a bit cranky. Well, it looks like it's almost over, so I just want to give a shout-out for a few things that are ha happening. I've got this group of authors that I'm putting together. for the. Well, first of all, my book, uh, Vision, comes out on September 9th um, from Spencer Hill Press, and the same day that that book comes out, um, Forest of Whispers by Jennifer Mergia also comes here. Here, here it is. Um, Vision. It's creepy, dark, boy point of view, but you know, young adult. But you could read it if you're an old adult. 
or not an adult. Um, and um, Jennifer's book is really cool. It's like a witch book. I did her cover, and she's mm -hmm. my twinny. We do a lot of things together. And we're actually going to be doing some uh, events. There's going to be one in the Bronx on October 9th um, with some other really cool authors, this, uh, Kate Bryan and um, Mikal Ostow and uh, Christy Cook and, oh, Elizabeth Keem. We're all going to be, we have, this, we have this group of authors. We're calling our, ourselves Tour de Noir. So if you go to my website or Twitter in the next few weeks, I'm going to be starting to talk about the Tour de Noir group of authors that are going to have various events in the New York area. Also, we're going to have one, well, in the metropolitan area, we're going to do something in, uh, we're going to have an online party um, in, around Halloween. We have the library event in Riverdale on October 9th. It's all going to be posted on my website, so you don't have to remember it. But also, on the day Vision and Forest of Whispers come out on September 9th, we're going to have an online event with you could win prizes and stuff. So just keep Ooh. checking out. There's going to be a lot going on. I'm, like, exhausted thinking about it, so that's why I'm sitting here. <laughs> Hi, birds. The birds and I are hanging out in mosquitoes and stuff and just chilling and um, just trying to, you know, relax until the craziness of September plus back to work, you know. Madness, but it sounds like <clears throat> sounds pretty exciting. Yeah, I might even try to twist Bronx Community College's arm and see if I could do something there. Because I did on my way to Book Expo. You're gonna think this is the craziest story. I'm walking into Book Expo on Saturday morning. Um, I, I got off the bus and I'm walking there, and um, I Saturday afternoon. I don't remember whatever day it was, and I'm going there and I there's just cute little girl with glasses, and she's walking, and we sort of almost bumped into each other. I'm like, oh, excuse me. And I go, oh, are you going to Book Expo? She goes, oh, yeah. I go, are you a writer? She's like, oh, no, I'm a librarian. I go, oh, how cool. I love librarians. Where are you a librarian? She goes, Bronx Community College. I'm like, what did you just say? I said, did you just say Bronx Community College? She goes, yeah. I go, okay, this is really weird. So it turns out that she is, that's where I teach, she is one of the librarians there, and I talked to her about maybe doing something there, and I haven't even been in touch with her uh, from that point. So I think, you know, I mean, obviously they know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they like to shout about stuff because yeah. they like, there's a lot of, it's a really cool campus, and it's beautiful, and we have a really gorgeous library there. Uh, what part of Bronx is it located? It's, uh... University Heights, I guess you would call it. It's like if you do you ever drive on the you ever been in the Bronx? You ever go on the Major um, Deegan? Well, if you've gone to Westchester, you've probably been through the Bronx. You cannot get to Westchester without going through the Bronx. Have you ever been on the Major De Major Deegan Parkway? If I have, I don't remember. I don't drive. Oh. Okay. Well, if you ever decide to look up the Hall of Fame, uh, the Hall of Fame. Is a famous building on the campus of Bronx Community College. It was designed by Stanford White. It looks like the Pantheon. It's the most amazing freaking thing you ever saw. That's our campus. It actually used to be NYU. The Beautiful Mind was filmed there. Oh. Good Shepherd. Good Shepherd with Matt Damon. De Niro was on our campus once, and nobody got to see him. <laughs> <laughs> Not for lack of trying. <laughs> okay, I know where it is. <laughs> yeah. It's a very, well, it's usually a nice campus when it's not under construction. It's been under a lot of construction. And I've, I've been involved, I've got did some mural works that I was involved with my students. And blah, 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 blah. I do too many things. <laughs> Don't we all? Oops. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff, though. Are we done? Uh, we've hit the two-hour mark, and... It just goes on endlessly. <laughs> just well, here. You know, I mean, you might have to shut me up, because I'll just keep talking. <laughs> Google will let us go for eight hours before kicking everyone off, but... Eight hours? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we we I think can I always have, have you on again. That, that's oh, not okay. a... That's Maybe not a get us a robot. 
Maybe maybe my Tordy Noir girls will want to do this. Maybe we could have an online crazy thing. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe uh, maybe Elizabeth will want to come. Hi, Elizabeth. Come on, talk about. Well, I don't know if you guys want to talk about Nathan now, but. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're bored, but we're gonna make you want to know about Nathan now. <laughs> In a special edition, I would want. We are. We're gonna make everybody want to know about Nathan. <laughs> We're going to make Nathan Hill sexy. Hey, he was 21 years old. I mean, come on. It wasn't like he was some farty old guy. He was a, he was a kid, basically. Mm -hmm. He's no Darcy, but... Uh, huh? He's no Darcy, but he'll do. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think I'm going to say goodbye because there's a hungry man roaming around in that house. And, uh, Is it me? I promised I was going to make some food. See, the glamorous life of a writer. It's so glamorous. <laughs> you know, glamorously buy some groceries and glamorously come back here and glamorously cook it in the kitchen. And <laughs> very glamorous. Really exciting. We do appreciate the uh, uh, you taking the time and hanging out with us, though. This was oh, now this I know what you found me. Fun, I, I swear to God, I didn't even know that we met at uh, BES. I really, I <laughs> it was you know, it was kind of hectic. So, so wow, I really made some good connections there. That's why I love BES. You know, I met you guys. I met the school teacher from Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna go to his class, and all kinds of bookstores, booksellers, and stuff. It's really always so much fun. And bloggers. It's great. It was like camp, right? <laughs> well, I have to say I did I really did enjoy myself. I was super nervous going there, but by the time the weekend was done, I was like crazy excited. I know. It's fun. Were you there every day? <laughs> yes. Well, let's see. Uh the first day I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But yeah. <clears throat> but the rest of the days I was there. Yeah. CJ made it to all the days though. Yeah. I missed some. I, I, I'm not going to go into it, but there was like a sort of a tragedy that took place like right before it, so I had to leave for some of it. It was really a weird situation, but um, being there really cheered me up a lot. It was really fun. Good. Yeah. It's always fun. It's getting really expensive, though. I hope, we're, I hope my publisher is able, I hope we're going to be able to come back next year. You know? I don't know what they, why they're doing that. Did you guys have to like were you guys just wandering around, or did you have a space? No, we just wandered. Yeah, because the spaces be are prohibitively impossible. expensive. Yeah, I mean, the one that we had was ridiculously expensive, and I, I don't know if it's going to even be doable next year, which really sucks. Yeah. You know? I hope it is. It would be nice to see you all again in person. Oh, well, we'll probably yes. manage to be there. We'll just come and wander around, and we want a place to go. <laughs> I just think we just have a hard time staying away. You know, it's too much fun. Mm. I don't think we'll be seeing me at Comic Con though. Mm. Yeah, I, ah. we did. I missed out on I missed out on the uh, the initial tickets, and it sold out in like a day. So. It's really not for book people. It's for people who love you know who are really out there and like to cosplay and. You know, I did that at the PyCon. It was fun, but I'm really just more internally crazy. I'm not that great about, you know, dressing up and stuff. You know, I'm not, I'm not like. Yeah, we kind we kind of like to get into uh, cosplay a little bit. Uh, me, I, uh, me, I have I have uh, three steampunk outfits that I wear for conventions. <laughs> Well, I have to admit, at PyCon I did, I was, I told you, you know, I'm into Sherlock, and I dressed up as a steampunk Irene Adler to the point where I actually had a writing crop. And if you go on Facebook, you guys could add me on Facebook, you will find me there as the world's probably least attractive Irene Adler, and I was actually hitting Trisha Wolters' husband with the writing crop, which was a, and the poor man, he was like, <laughs> oh yeah, and I did that. And I put it online. Shameless. It was, good. it was good. I had a corset. Yeah, I know. It's probably a crime for me to be wearing a corset. I mean, I don't even want to tell you how old I am, and I really should learn to behave. But I'm probably not. 
Listen, we all go by a, uh, a phrase here. Uh, growing old is required. Growing up is optional. Yeah, well, I've already, and, I've already like crossed that off my to-do list. Growing up. <laughs> <laughs> What's really alarming is that one of my colleagues that I work with, we look at each other and we're like, "Yeah, we're professors. Are we growing up? <laughs> yeah." <laughs> <laughs> Should see our faculty meetings. Some of them get violent. <laughs> Here's a story. I'm in the hall with one of my colleagues, and we are actually strangling each other. <laughs> like we're like this. <laughs> Hi, Tammy. And uh, my boss is like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "It's a meeting. <laughs> we're having a meeting." This is what goes on here. Yeah. It's true. Yeah, it kind of sounds like some of our meetings. Is that my job? <laughs> what? Sounds like some of our meetings whenever we get together. Oh, but this is a this is a college. It's a university. It's like on the payroll. It's a it's an art department. You know, art and music. So I mean, faculty meetings are full of artists and musicians. And yeah, we get down to business and we teach and we're good, but you know, we're all a little nuts. You know, professionally so. We take it very seriously. So. Well, Lisa, I feel like I could talk to you for hours. However, I do have to actually go. Yeah, I should go now. This is so, but I'll we, come back. I'm going to speak for CJ please because do. he's not. Uh, yeah, please come back anytime. I will. Maybe, maybe, I'll see, maybe, I don't know. I might have scared people like who would come back with me, but I'll see if I could, you know, get some of my uh, pals on here. You can come back on under what a pseudonym or something. you probably don't want to do that would be really unsafe is to ever have me and Kate Kynack on here at the same time. Have you met Kate? Not yet. From Spencer Hill Press, the head of Spencer Hill Press? You put the two of us in a room, it's, it's scary. <laughs> it's really scary. Right? That just sounds like a challenge. Mm. No, but it's fun. It's lots of fun. <laughs> and then we can write Ricky. Like, it causes oh, the ions and the electrons to kind of you know, <laughs> around us. And other people just kind of go, Oh, what's going on? It's David. Yeah. So, probably you want to put somebody on who's calmer than me. Like Jennifer. Provost. She's crazy, but she's like more like low key about it. Yeah, Some she's, of the one -liners. she's on the very extensive list of all the fun people I want to get on the show. Oh, she is to. amazing. We had a we had a panel together, me and her. Oh, another really great person to get on with me is Rich Storms, <laughs> the, the closer from Spencer and Press. Do you know what he said to me at the EA? Mm -hmm. He was standing, him and his wife, they're like, you know, very uh, important at Spencer Hope Press. And uh, I said, oh, look, it's my parents, because she's my book mommy and he's the closer. And he looks at me and he goes, <laughs> oh, Rich, he goes, you have socks older than me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you son of a... Yeah, about that. <laughs> yeah, you should get him on here. You should get them all on. It would probably blow up the internet, but it would be fun. Well, it wouldn't be the first time we've been responsible for that. Mm. <laughs> Alright, guys. Well, this was really, really fun. I had a blast. This was just like having a cool hangout with a bunch of pals all afternoon drinking water. I should have got myself some wine or something, um, you know, and um, it was really fun. Yeah, I'm glad you can make I'm it. I'm always the you. last person to leave a party, so you should probably just kick me off. <laughs> like, you could ask anybody who knows me. I'm usually, me and my husband, we're always the last ones to leave. <laughs> we just don't stop talking. Hmm. And my husband's quiet, but, like, when he's at a party, he just doesn't want to leave. I'm like, honey, come on, let's go. Let's keep talking. <laughs> yeah. We'll definitely be in touch to figure out another time you can come on and see who else we can get in on the fun. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll ask around. You could ask, hello, Spencer Hope Press people. I'm inviting you. You could stand in with me. It will be fun. You should have us all. Eric. Eric's fun. Mm. Yes, we had Eric. Eric was fun. Yeah, Eric's, Eric's very cool. Really cool. Um, we're all cool. Okay. Bye, Anata. Thank right. you for yep. having me. See you around. Thank you for coming. Okay. Really appreciate it.
Take care. Live long and whatever. Yep. I'm signing off. <laughs> Bye. 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 <laughs> That's more fun than it should have been. <laughs> in, in interest of time, I would like to make a motion to... Denied. Okay. To <laughs> take the uh, the Muse food and take the, um, the other talking point and table them for next week's meeting. Or podcast. Sorry, this isn't a meeting. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm willing to table the talkie point. The uh, Muse food is created each week, so that's already up on the website. People can play with those as they see fit. But yeah, in the interest of time, I think we're going to skip the live reading of them. If you want to check them out, fcwriters.com, the Muse food section, the latest one is on the home page. It has the full archives there as well. Uh, I can't imagine that too much has transpired in the last week in regards to goals and aspirations and all that, so I'm perfectly content leaving that for probably next Monday at this rate because next weekend is convention weekend. Woo-woo! I may actually be able to go to this one. <laughs> Yay. Hooray. You mean we'll actually have a completely full crew at a convention? It's possible. Craziness. Unfortunately, I have to miss Friday, uh, but I'll be there bright and early Saturday. Right. Yeah, quite literally. I'm getting yeah. on a bus. I'm getting on a bus to Northampton at 5:30 in the bloody morning. I heard about this insanity. Mm. Yes. And I'm going. <laughs> and I'm going to be fully dressed too. So yeah. I'll be. I'll be. I'll be in freaking Manhattan. Uh, I'm leaving my house at like either 3.30 or 4 in the morning to uh, make it to the bus station in time, with plenty of time. So I'm going to be in Manhattan, dressed in steampunk garb, at 4 in the morning. Now, mind you, I'll be in time. I'll be in the Times Square area, so I'll probably, not blend, that blend, <laughs> I'll probably blend in very well. <laughs> well, actually, I'm not sure, especially since my... Uh, since my new camera bag came in, and this is what it looks like. New camera bag, you say? Uh, this here is the, Tim, the Timbuktu Sleuth camera bag. Nice. I got also, I just lucky. figured out that Amherst is right next to where we're going to be. And there's an excellent wings place in Amherst that also has a bar, and I think that uh, we should go. Uh, we can figure out logistics and feasibility off-air. Yes. Because the people they... don't really want to listen to that. Correct. <laughs> and Calvin, I, I'm i covering press for Friday. I got all the little random baubles and whatnots I need to get my camcorder running for that long. Okay, great. And I think I'm going to do a similar setup to you where I'll use my... Uh, little portable recorder for the audio. I can just toss it on the table since I don't have a convenient Frankenstein's monster creation to hold it all on one thing. <laughs> no problem, no problem. But we'll make it work. Yeah, we always do. Mm. More or less. Yeah, between the camcorder I can take about eight hours worth of high def video and there's only like 10 hours worth of content on Friday is this more appropriate for off-air discussion yeah, probably considering we're already at 220 oh dang really yeah <laughs> we're good at rambling I'm surprised Justin hasn't run away in frustration yet every time I, I go to do it it sounds like we're about to end I do have a hard out coming up very soon, so I suggest wrapping this up. All right. Now, it looked like Calvin was going to say something. Oh. Um, do we feel like doing attributions? I figure we'll do the two events that are next weekend, 
just to remind people and then sign out with who we are and where people can find us. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm not going to quickly enough. There are two events next weekend. A majority, if not all of us, are going to be at Inconceivable in Northampton, Massachusetts in some degree or combination, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, we have the links to all that stuff on the website. You can check it out. It's like $35 for the whole weekend and considerably cheaper for a day if you just want to go up one day. Definitely worth checking out. We're, we have a vendor table. We're doing three panels this time around. It's going to be crazy. And if you miss it for whatever reason, we're going to be getting a lot of recordings in. So check the channel. Our affiliate, Itty Bitty Sheep, the fantabulous illustrator, is going to be at Connecticut Comic Con that weekend. Uh, I keep blanking on the location of that, but obviously it's in Connecticut. It is to do Bridgeport, Connecticut. So yeah, if you're in that area, definitely go check it out. That one is going to be crazy. That one is a lot of comic book, graphic novel absurdity. Kind of wish that we could make that. It's a shame that we're kind of double booked that weekend between everyone. But yeah, that's where everyone will be next weekend. So there will be no live episode on Sunday. Probably going to be Monday night, kind of similar to Kineticon style, since that's how we roll. So keep an eye out on social media. We'll keep you up to date on that. And with that, let's try and wrap up before we hit two and a half hours outright. Who are we crazy people and where can you find us on the internets? Going down the list in traditional style of left to right, Calvin. There we go. All right. Uh, I'm going to make this quick. Uh, my website is calvin.cwilia.ms. You can find me on Tumblr at Instacal. You can find me on SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash cwny. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at ccwii. And Justin. Uh, currently, you can't find me anywhere. <laughs> I have been very elusive as of late. I even went so far as deleting my Facebook account and then, then getting a new one. That's a long story, and uh, hopefully the website and other social media will be up in order probably by the end of the month, I suspect. So I will uh, pimp my stuff there. All right. And the silent one, Will. <clears throat> you can find me on Tumblr at darkom.tumblr.com, D-A-R-K-H-O-M. And you can find most of my writings on my roommate's stripper.tumblr.com. Both of those are not safe for work. As for me, you can track me down on my zombify Twitter handle, silver underscore wolf85. My personal Tumblr is fancypantswolf.tumblr.com. That is NSFW-ish because I'll post whatever the heck I feel like at any given time. And for full coverage writers, which covers anything and everything we do in full absurdity, the website for that is fcwriters.com. If you want to check out any of our shiny baubles, and we keep on finding more, you can check out our Etsy store, which Ed is handling, etsy.com slash shop slash full coverage writers. Uh, YouTube channel, if you want to check out all of the previous episodes and author interviews and book reviews and all that good stuff, you can just search for Full Coverage Writers at YouTube, or the short URL is wnja.us slash YouTube. Our literary Twitter handle is at fcwordninja. Our literary Tumblr, fcwordninja.tumblr.com. Facebook is facebook.com slash fullcoveragewriters, and our email for anything and everything else is wordninja at fcwriters.com. And with that, that's going to wrap up episode 54 of Word Ninjas Live. Tune in sometime next week for episode 55 and find out if we survived Inconceivable. Until next week, everyone. Adios. Bye.